Well, like you heard, COVID-19 has come, it's changed our lives, it has affected us in multiple ways. It has changed the way we think, act, live. It pretty much just, it's kind of like turned everything. But in it, it has also created opportunities for us to impact our worlds. It has also given us that unique opportunity to impact on our communities and our spheres of contact. And today, on this morning's episode of COVID-19 Heroes, we do have yet another hero, an individual we consider an impact of positive proportion. <laughs> I don't know if that's correct, but hey, if you know what I mean, as our guest today. But it's not part of my duties today to let you know who our guest is. So I'll start by bringing my co-hosts, um, friend to my boss just saying <laughs> and friend to me too Weber, how are you doing good to see you again today <laughs> good morning collins I, I see you so many times now i, I, I feel like I, I i think i see you more than the people i actually work with every day <laughs> <laughs> well, man it's it's a good thing um I'm, I'm happy always happy to see you good so it's covid 19 heroes we do have yes. another guest yes. today yes so Today we have a great guest, uh, Dr. Akimumi Fajola, mm -hmm. who is joining us from Port Harcourt. He's the Regional Community Health Manager, Sub-Saharan Africa for Shell Night. Well, so not Shell Nigeria, but for Shell Africa. So he's this is a big, a big old guy working with the biggest company in Nigeria and and leading their community health work. So thank you so much, Dr. Fajola, for coming on the show today. Thank you very much, Weber. You you made my head swell a bit. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I'm All right. All right. Thank you. So listen, um, but just if you could kick us off by telling us a bit about yourself, your own background, the journey that you had to become um, this uh, to take on this leadership role for community health in Shell. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'll say that's a tricky one. Um, okay, summary, I graduated in medicine and surgery about um, two and a half decades ago and um, from the University of Illinois. And um, I had my housemanship here at um, the University College Hospital in Ibadan, uh, UCH Ibadan. Uh, from then, I, I think um, one of the best years that I really had was during my youth service. Um, I served in Kaduna State and um, during the youth service, my trajectory actually changed. Okay. Uh, that was where that was where public health came into into the game. Um, my teachers and I was clear that I was going into obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, but during that year, um, I, I served in the barracks, Depot Nigeria Army Barracks. And um, the first two weeks when I got there, there were some things that stared me in the face. They had a lot of primary, secondary schools um, in in that barracks, and there were some issues with sexual and reproductive health. And I just felt. I should do something about it. Uh, I got in touch with the post abortal care network of Nigeria, the UNICEF, and from that um, we were able to reach a, quite a number of youths and adolescents. And that that was the turning point for me because I saw that just staying in the in the clinics itself doesn't do a lot, but population health is critical. Um, what what followed that was I won a Kaduna State Merit Award for my youth service year. And so when I got back into my residency here, yeah, I just veered off from obstetrics and gynecology into public health. And I think that has been the trajectory since then. Um, I've then done a master's in public health. I'm a Mashab scholar. I got uh, sponsorship from the country of Israel. And I, I, was, I went into the Brown School of Public Health and Medicine um, in Israel, Jerusalem. Uh, I was there for some time. And then I uh, came back um, into the country. Uh, I became the country director for country coordinator for the Institute of Human Biology, um, University of Maryland, um, now called IHV Nigeria. I served as the focal point between the government of Nigeria and CDC Atlanta then. It's, it's mm -hmm. now a full-fledged organization. We brought the presidential emergency plan, uh, President Bush emergency plan for HIV relief uh, 
into Nigeria then uh, with some other NGOs, Family Health International and all the rest. And that really opened me up into, into the public health space. Um, I've also served as um, Nigeria Immunization Days Consultant, World Health Organization Consultant, and it really gladdens my heart because we, we, we started the Kick Polio Out uh, with Mrs. Awushika in the early, late 90s, 97, 98, 99. And it's really a new day when we discovered we, we kicked polio out. Uh, I've worked in Kano. I was co-facilitator in Kano, in Imo State, um, and so on. So it, it, it's been a new day. And from there, um, th then I, I now came into Shell. And I mean, so many people ask me, why Shell? You know, why? Uh, but I mean, as we go on the program, I'll be able to highlight what that organization has been able to do to uh, healthcare in, in Nigeria. It's a new day. Wow, that's quite impressive. But 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 how does a distinguished public health professional find himself in an oil company you know, for so long? You know, how have you been able to make or create impact? Hmm. Wow. What, what, what I would say is, um, for me, and, and I say it with all sense of responsibility, it's, it's a vocation. You know, when you take something as a vocation, um, it's, um, I think that when, when you have passion in what you do, it's a form of self-actualization. And I think this is really where I've been actualized. Um, going around, going into communities. I work a lot in the Niger Delta, and I say it without any exaggeration. I've been to over 157 communities in Nigeria's Niger Delta and in mm -hmm. so many other parts of Nigeria. And the, the people are the same. The people are happy. The people are joyful. What they want is health care. What they want is um, address the simple social determinants of health. You know, so working with those people, the ability to be able to add value to their lives, take health care to the doorsteps of hmm. those communities. I, th I tell you, it, there's no more joy that that can bring to you. And if you now work in an organization that allows you, and I say this with all sense of responsibility, the organization I work for, is one of the few organizations that has a team that is de dedicated to the communities where it operates and mm -hmm. share. So we have been given that leeway, and as a public health medicine professional and as an epidemiologist, I've been given leeway to do that with my with my highly um, qualified team, vibrant team, and we take healthcare to the doorsteps of the people. Mm -hmm. We have bouquet of health services to the people, mm -hmm. and them taking their healthcare in their hands and running with it, taking ownership. There's nothing like when you see a community take the driver's seat of their health in their hands and run with it. And that's why a lot of the programs that we've been able to do have been sustainable because sustainability is the name of the game. So I, I think that that's really how, how it's been. Impressive. So, so, doc, so Dr. Fajula, as a specialist in public health and epidemiology, um, what, what's your assessment of Nigeria and Africa's COVID response? That's the first part of the question. The second part is, and, and the last time, we, we actually had another Dr. Akin on a few weeks ago, the, the health commissioner. I, okay. Why are all the public health people called Dr. Akin? I don't know. Um, but, but many still wonder why we haven't been hit in Nigeria worse with the pandemic. I mean, why, why do you think that's the case? So both sort of how has the response been, but then how come... How come the impact has not been as serious as one might have expected? Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, um, and and I think the, the response. Um, some people will say, "Why am I saying this?" But for me, the response has been excellent. And I'll take it at the, at the Nigerian level and at the African level. When when I when I look at the combination of things, uh, one of the things we used to do in time past is through through resources and things, through money and things. But health is something that takes time to build. Mm -hmm. And my joy, uh, one, of, one of the things I say is that many times it's not about resources, it's about resourcefulness. And when you look at it from the national level to the individual, we've taken ownership. Um, at the national level, you can see the coordination. My joy was the coordination. Many times we beat the air, but in this one, you could see a plan. Um, you could see the PTF, you could see the NCDC working in tandem with the Ministry of Health. You could see the body language of, of um, Dr. Chikwe and Professor Inahiri and the team. So you could see that there was a team. There was a protocol that was flowing from the top. And the states, except for one or two states who initially did not join the bandwagon, you could see that there was a plug-in from the states. 
and you could see that there was the plug-in even from the private sector. And I tell you, everywhere where health and development has worked, it's always public-private people partnership. I call it PPP. You know, I put the people there because if the people are not part of it, then it's nothing. And when, when, when we got to that level where the people on the streets, also, yes, a lot of people still said, no, this is not there. But you saw that people took personal responsibility mm -hmm. in, in, in a lot of places. You see the people, they are the ones that will say, oh, wear your mask. Take. So that's responsibility across the value chain. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think really um, this response has done well. We've been able to build capacity, um, human resources for health. I tell you, the transformation in our health sector, we will see it over years. Um, because of this, because of uh, the drops that have come from this, infection prevention and control has become a new thing in a lot of our facilities. Um, risk communication is now the order of the day. Our colleagues and family have called us into their program. This is also part of the trick. And you can see the electronic media, the radio. Mm -hmm. You can see everybody has come in to take ownership and to drive it. So I think our response has been good. The collaboration in Africa has been excellent. I saw one or two countries just go verbatim into the NCDC website and just pull the, all the protocols on the NCDC website. But, but the NCDC shared it with them. So yes, we could have said, no, this is copyright. This is our stuff. But we, we, we started to share. And I think that, that's where that has come. And when you look at the developmental partners from WHO to UNICEF, to everybody has come into the game. Um, if you look at the oil industry that I represent, the oil industry, you have competing organizations, but the organizations have come together for a common goal uh, to deliver value. So I think we've done quite well. I, I would say we, we, are, we are close to an 80% trading. Really. That's, that's the truth. Well, still wondering, he speaks with so much hope and optimism and fact. He's our guest on COVID-19 Heroes. On Nigeria's number one for talk on 99.3 Nigeria Info. Now, I would like to know, uh, Dr. Uh, Akimumi uh, Fajola, let's, let's, let's uh, on a high level, right, tell us briefly about Shell's COVID-19 support strategy. Okay, um, Shell's strategy. Maybe before I go into that strategy, because it's so easy to talk about strategy, mm -hmm. um, we, are, we, are, we are into this. Um, and m many times people talk about corporate social responsibility. This is not about corporate social responsibility. Okay. It's, it's, it's really not about social performance. Yeah. It's about what is right to do. And that is what, as an organization, we want to do what is right. It's about shared value, because it's about you and me. Mm -hmm. um, I remember something I think Nelson Mandela said some time ago, the Ubuntu spirit. I am because we are. You know, so the right thing to do is to join in. And I think that's that's really why we are into this, to take value to the doorsteps of our people, to hold ourselves and to help ourselves. So when we talk about strategy, we draw our strategy um, from, from the national, mm. from whatever the national is doing. Yeah. And we've had very excellent guidance from our senior partners. That's the NMPC. Fortunately, we've also been able to work together with other oil industry players. And um, that has given us um, a, a head start and a direction of travel. So when we look at our strategy, um, part of the strategy of the nation is the test, treat, trace, isolate strategy. So one of the things we've said, ab initio was the fact that we want to strengthen most of the COVID isolation centers, work with government to do that. Logistics was very, very important. Hmm. There were so many things. It was not just about the hospital. It's about moving people. It's about transport. It's about testing. It's about certifying labs. So one of the things we did very high, very um, early in the program was to begin to look at where can we add value. Um, you talked about Professor Akin Abayomi, very excellent man. Uh, and it's not because his name is Akin, my name is Akin. Um, very humble. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I mean, this, this in Lagos State with the incident commander, Governor Soho, they, they set up a team and reached out to the private sector. And one of the things we were able to do was to support logistics, uh, loaned out some vehicles to them. In River State, we did the same. So logistics was critical. The other thing was, to look inwardly, even in our, in, our, in our organization, 
Okay. And uh, maybe we'll still get there. Maybe I'll highlight that we we worked together as as a staff in in Shell to also donate to some of the to to the isolation centers. Um, another strategy was risk communication because you needed to reach the grassroots, the boots on the ground, the people to have information in a language that they understand. Awareness, social mobilization is the name of the game in a contagion like this, in a pandemic like this. So those were key critical things we looked at. Um, if we have enough time, they will be able to expand shape. Yeah, so Doc, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into some of those, but the first one I wanted to look at is the, the one where you mentioned that Shell staff themselves actually put their own personal money forward to donate. Um, mm. And then I believe that Shell matched it and then, and then sort of mobilized it and then used that as, as part of the response. So what yeah. motivated so many Shell staff to give up their own resources in such a big way? And then how were those funds used? Well, whoever, I mean, truly it's, uh, it's inspirational. Um, the, our organization has um, what we call the, the Shell Care Agenda, Shell Cares. But, but it's not just about mouthing it. It's about really seeing the passion with which people carry this. Because mouthing is a different thing and really doing, doing the right thing. Um, so without the prompting of the organization, this, the, the, the staff pulls together. This is not the first time the Shell Employees Care Program was doing this. Um, during Ebola, um, some years ago when we had flood disasters in the Niger Delta, Shell, Shell staff actually came together. People put down part of their salary. In fact, one of my bosses was saying recently, one staff called him and said, look, I'm, I'm putting half of my salary into this. And he, he was just asking a question. What moves someone to say, I'm putting half of my salary, three quarter of my salary into this? It's because of confidence. It's because you believe in the other person. Um, I remember when I was in Israel, there's an aphorism that, that they say, Tikkun Olam, the sanctity of human life. When you have that in you, um, I think it drives, it's an inspirational thing. So what has happened is the Shell community um, staff put money together and the company was so happy. And then the company and our senior partners, NMPC, matched, matched that amount of money that the Shell team put together. And what then happened was that um, the, the people themselves said, look, what area can we put these resources that we know will add value to people? And then we went to the isolation centers. And so we looked at isolation centers in about seven states, from Rivers to Delta to Bayelsa to Limo uh, to Wabia. Um, Ogun, we'll be going to Ogun very soon, to Lagos, you know, and then go to those places and then feed the, the patients in the isolation center um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and not just the patients alone, also the frontline staff that are there. So the frontline staff, not just the doctors, not just the nurses, our, our excellent cleaners, our drivers, who the gate men, who did the work. So because the patients also need to go through with things like this, their immunity, we need to give them good food. Mm -hmm. We worked with civil society organizations because these are other people's money. So we needed to be accountable with it. Uh, in Lagos, we did mainland hospital. In Lagos, it was only in Lagos that we did daily lunch. But in all the other states, we did uh, um, breakfast, lunch, dinner. To, as of today, we've covered about 40, 45,000 meals. Um, wow. We are going for 50 days. So we are not stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just a thing of joy. That's, that's the truth. Fantastic. I know you probably w was wondering what happened, Collins. Were you trying to say stop? No, that's me <laughs> celebrating, saying that it's quite inspirational what I've heard and uh, what you just said. So uh, picking on from what you said, uh, Doctor, you, you talked about the fact that um, the support, the COVID-19, Shell's COVID-19 support focused on uh, more on a number of states. You mentioned Abia, Bayesa, Delta, Imo, Rivas. You also mentioned Lagos. You said Ogun and, and on your state. Now, how were these states selected? And um, what was the focus of intervention? Okay, okay. Um, so, Collins, um, Shell has a large footprint in Nigeria, as mm -hmm. the truth, but yeah. a very large footprint in the Niger Delta. Um, our fo we, ha we have maybe... Maybe I should just say three basic three basic companies in Nigeria. Oh, SPDC right. Shell Petroleum Development Company mm -hmm. covers the Niger Delta. Okay. Shell Nigeria Expansion um, Company Production Company Snepco okay. based in Lagos. Okay. Um, a lot of our offshore activities and it's pan Nigeria. And then we have Shell Nigeria Gas, yeah. okay, and that does domestic gas and other other yeah. things. So mm -hmm. um, 
basically we looked at our areas the focus is basically our states of operation first mm -hmm. and then um, i mean next week we'll be going to Nasarawa states uh, uh even to to deliver value to get the pcr machine and some other consumables there um before covid we are in other parts we are in the northeast in Tikwa community in the, in uh in Bornu state so we are we are going across the value chain but like colin said um, we principally first focus on the companies of, of in, the, uh, in the states of operation. Okay. And what we did there was to look at testing capacity, infrastructure, critical equipment. So in all these states, we've given PCR machines uh, that are very important in strengthening the laboratory capacity. Um, of the, because when we started this, you remember that laboratory capacity was new. We had only maybe about 10 or 13 molecular labs. And in river states, uh, we strengthened the River State University Teacher Hospital Molecular Lab with two PCR machines, um, extractor machines that made, made the molecular lab start its first test. Uh, we then saw that uh, University of Port Harcourt Teacher Hospital was also nearly ready. We gave another PCR machine there, ICU, ICU ambulances, ventilator support, and so on, across the end-to-end -end process in these states. And the joy is that these have been used because we also have our monitoring and evaluation mechanism. And we've gone through and see that these are values. And the excitement and the joy, again, is the, is the collaboration between the states and uh, the people. And the fact that when you look at data, there is joy that the little that has trickled from this oil industry um, has added value to people, has added value to Nigeria's response in this pandemic. And I think it's a new day. A good so, one. Doctor, uh, what I think we're running short of time, but that's um, right. let's let's um, let, let's uh, go on another question. So, Shell also contributed sort of a, a big industry part of a big industry response. I believe it was a thirty million dollar response um, under the NNPC under the Industry Association. So, what who coordinated all that, and then um, what did that response consist of, and how was it like to work with all the competitors in one in one room and 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 kind of all work together on this particular approach? So, so, so when competitors work together, you know that it's a it's a big deal. And yeah. my joy, the way that the oil industry banded together with the country, our senior partner, the NMPC, I doff my hat to, to to NMPC. We came together with um, the oil producers, uh, technical service team, OPTS, and other. And um, there's a there's a pot of about thirty million dollars into different aspects of logistics, infrastructure. PPEs and so on, and a lot has really gone into it. There's an accountability process that it follows. You know that the oil industry is always very accountable in these areas, and um, a lot has been done in that area. Time may not permit us, but something that is key that I need to say here is the way that the governments have worked with us, especially the state governments. And I mean, I, I say with all sense of responsibility, not because I'm, I'm here, but for Lagos State, from the incident commander, um, Governor Sowolu, to Dr. Professor Abayomi. And, and the war cabinet in Lagos State, the support has been tremendous. We've been able to work together. Um, um, in fact, we saw at some point that Lagos State needed a, a plasma efferesis machine because we needed to look at whether the plasma could treat. And we were able to provide this because wow. of the support that we are. We are also an essential service organization. Mm -hmm. People were coming into the country because production had to increase, I mean, continue. But the state worked with us to make sure that protocols were followed, everything was done. You know, there are times when there may be issues, but we worked hand in hand. And for me, it was it was also a yardstick to show that, I mean, there is a way to work. And I, I'm really excited about the, the partnership with Lagos State, with River State, Delta, and a few other states that um, we saw pockets of excellence in, in a lot of places. So I, I really want to say a big thank you to the government, uh, to what they've done to the IOCs during this period. All right. I actually want this question answered. I mean, you are uh, you are an expert in public health. Uh, you're a public health professional, no doubt. Uh, are we at the the peak of the pandemic, or should we start getting ready for uh, a normal life? Will that happen anytime soon? I mean, how quickly can you answer that question in in seconds? Well, mm. well, is that that's a tough one. I, I mean, to tell you the truth, in, mm. in a lot of places in Nigeria, and yeah. I will say that. Um, I think we are at the peak. Yeah. I think we, we, are, we, are already, we are already at the peak. Okay. Um, there's still a lot of community transmission going on. Right. Okay? 
um, but uh, it now behoves on us um, because this is a new normal. Yeah. So we can't say we are going back to, to a normal life now. It's mm. going to be with us for some time more, okay? <laughs> the infection is around, so we need to take personal responsibility is the name of the game. Um, um, economic, the, we, we cannot close down the economy, mm. okay? So people need to go back to work, so we need to, we need to watch that. Schools are going to open. So once we are able to take care and we need to continue to do a lot of this communication, I think um, that curve can go down a little, but I think we have reached our peak, really. That's, that's, that's my thinking. Thank you very much. That's it. You just heard Dr. Akinwu Fajola, Regional Community Health Manager, Sub-Saharan Africa, Shell, Nigeria. Quite a big man. Thank you again for speaking with us and thank you for speaking with so much optimism and hope. I really love the way you spoke, I must say, personally. Weber, we have to go. Do yes, so Dr. Fajola, thank you again. Thank you very much for, for all of the insight you provided and I think also to give us a bit of a view of what the oil companies have done for this in, in, in a meaningful way. And I think what most inspired me was this, the, the, the personal donations from staff, but then also the entire industry coming together as one. So thank you for what you do. And thanks for the big, big part that you have played in, in addressing the pandemic. And, and, and you're definitely a big COVID hero. So thank you for what you do. Well, and thanks for this opportunity, Collins. Please say hi to Femi. I I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an avid sports fan, and I know that he's a sports guy too. Absolutely. Thanks, yeah, he will. Right. He's definitely listening. Thank you so much, gentlemen. We have to go. The news is coming up now. That's it for COVID-19 heroes. Until next week, we'll bring another hero. Be good. My name is Collins. Take care. And I've worked on this part with Dr. Weber Boer. 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's talk. This is your number one station. Number one station. Number one. 99.3 Nigeria Info. 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's talk.